First panel one is here, up from California, and they've been told to speak briefly. I mean by that, it's just a signal to those members of panels that when I say that, that's a signal. Tim Stanley, Carl Mamal Mamalamud, is that right? Malamud, sir. Thank you. And Carl Olson, would you please come here and speak to us? This is panel one. Panel two with Susan Graber, the Oregon State Bar. Will not be here, but there is a letter at each one of your stations, single little statement from the State Bar. We will then go to public testimony. Gentlemen, I don't know who wants to go first, but as you probably know, you need to say who you are, what you are, and where you're from. It's just a record. And then please proceed. Good. I'd like to do this, if you don't mind, unless it really one of you is going crazy. We let them do their presentation, and then we ask them any questions. Now, unless you really can't take it, it it's, it's something you just got to do, then I'll let you do it. Otherwise, could we just do that, please? Oh, wait a minute. Do we want to call? The, We're going to call Senator Brown. You got to hold, because we want to call Senator Brown, who wants to be here. I mean, she wants to be here, but she's not here, which means she's going to be here by phone. Thank you. Are you nervous, gentlemen? No. no. Well, you should be. <laughs> I mean, I just say that just to say it. I mean, they're from California. I want them to be a little nervous. Let me amend his answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just trying to keep it. Senator Brown, we're trying to reach Senator Kate Brown on the phone. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to lose patience. Could we? Do we need to dial a one yes. from here? Yes. Yeah, why don't you dial, dial one? one. Yeah. Dial nine. Five zero three. Two two two. Three three. I'm sorry. Outside, we got what we're doing is we're trying to stop leaks. That's what's going on outside. They are hustling out there, buddy. They're flat out getting after it. Do you want me to close the curtains? No, don't. No, I want to see sunshine. Do not close those curtains. Actually, we need the curtains shut. This is Kate Brown. Kate, this is Peter Courtney. Hi, Peter Courtney. You're here now with all of us. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> well, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, we're now going to hear some. Hear some. Hear, we're now going to hear from some witnesses. Okay. Okay. You know what's going on, right? Yes. Because I called you. Okay. All right, gentlemen, now you may proceed, please. Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, Senate President Courtney, uh, Majority Leader Hunt, uh, honorable members of the Legislative Council Committee, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to appear here today. Uh, my name is Carl Malamud, and I'm the president of publicresource.org. Uh, we are a nonprofit corporation, and what we do is make government information more widely accessible to the public without charge. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to dwell on the legalities of what constitutes a creative work and the long line of court decisions on that topic, but I would like to address why I care so much about whether or not the Oregon Revised Statutes can be copied and used without requesting prior permission or receiving express or implied consent. Uh, access to the law is a vital part of our democratic system. Uh, law is our society's user manual. It's our operating system. The, the cases and codes of the local, state, and federal governments are the rules by which we govern ourselves, and those rules must be an open book if we're going to be a nation of laws. So this is a question about democracy, but it's also about something else. It's about innovation, and of course, it's about money. One might argue that the state of Oregon already provides public access to the public statutes through the website of the Legislative Council. And the question of why is that enough and why must this data be available for use without restriction? Uh, before dealing with that, however, I think there's two points that are important. The first is how can, without copyright, can the state gain revenue if anybody can publish the data? And I think the answer to that is very simple, that the Legislative Council is in fact the official publisher and compiler of the laws and publishes the official version of the laws. And we have absolutely no objection to the Legislative Council selling such an official certified copy. And I believe that most practicing lawyers in Oregon would opt for such an official copy because they don't want to take the risk of having an unofficial copy and getting it wrong. And so I don't believe you would have a hit on revenue by changing your policy. The second question is authenticity of the Oregon Revised Statutes. As Representative Rosenbaum and others have, have brought up, uh, what if somebody alters the Oregon Revised Statutes and puts a doctored version online? That obviously is not a good thing. 
But copyright is not the right tool for dealing with that. There are digital signatures, and the Legislative Council could use technologies called MD5 or SHA-1 signatures, and that is a technique for allowing any user to verify that the text they're looking at is unaltered from the time it was published. And so those tools, official copies and digital signatures, are available. I think the important thing here is that if the only providers of public data are a few government webmasters and their counterparts at the high-priced commercial services, the citizens of Oregon are not well served. Allowing public use under limited circumstances does not solve a barrier to entry problem and it does not solve the confusion issue of some high school student wanting to download the statutes and create a better version. Even a public license makes that very confusing. Um, and having dealt with copyright issues for a long time, I know that when there are licenses, and the licenses tend to be long, even Creative Commons licenses, it makes it murky. It, it discourages people from using that information, which is one reason we work so hard at putting free law online. And in this sense, the Oregon Revised Statutes are part of a, of a broader role, part of a collective body of data known as works of government. And it's been clearly established in the United States that these works of government are in the public domain. And that's particularly true with the laws and the other work products of the legislature. Um, the courts have been very clear about saying that if we are a nation of laws, we must be able to read them. But that's also true for broader information, and something that makes the United States so special is that the works of government of the states and of the federal government have been in the public domain. And that has led to things like the internet. It's led to, um, to global positioning systems. It's led to mapping data and things like Google Maps. And so in that sense, the Oregon Revised Statutes and all the rest of the laws and the materials that, that are the work product of the Oregon state government are an important economic driver. And by having those works in the public domain, that spurs a lot of economic activity and more importantly, innovation and the innovation is what lets citizens read the law in a more effective manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senate President Courtney, uh, Majority Leader Hunt, and the honorable members of the committee, my name is Carl Olson. Uh, I am a lawyer. I am counsel for Justia, Inc., and for public.resource.org. I've specialized in copyright and media law for approximately 25 Council, years. Council, just one second. Uh, Senator Brown, can you pick up this testimony? Not barely. Yeah, I'm afraid of that. We got tremendous noise in the background because they're doing construction outside. Uh, are these things in front of them? Or, or no. Did we put? I don't know long of them, too. Huh? I don't think it's long of them. Do you think maybe? We could maybe. Uh, could, could you, you put, like, one of these in front of Senator Nelson, maybe put that over there? I'm just trying to set, make sure Senator Brown can hear this. And could you please, the microphones are pretty good, but I'm not trying to eat it, but try to, can you reach it from there? I'm not sure you can reach it from there. You're not going to be able to reach it. Is this better? Uh, are we improving anything, Senator Brown? Hello? Kate? Yeah. Can, can you hear me? I just go on. Council, just go on. I can't do anything with it. Go ahead. You've Thank you, Council. You've identified yourself, so please proceed. Okay. Uh, we start from the basic proposition uh, that the law cannot be copyrighted. There are a few principles that are quite so well settled. The U.S. Supreme Court held that in 1834 in a case called Wheaton versus Peters, reiterated that in a case called Banks versus Manchester in 1888, and, uh, and it certainly cannot be copyrighted by states. Uh, moving to this century, the Court of Appeals in a case called VEC versus Southern Building Codes Congress reiterated that the law is in the public domain and is not amenable to copyright. It held that anyone wanting to publish state statutes can use any copy. Laws are facts. Facts cannot be copyrighted. And VEC also, um, apropos of what we're talking about here today, emphasized the need for access to the law. The, uh, 
the person claiming copyright in that case said, well, it's available for inspection in a public office. People can go to the office. The court said, we disagree that the question of public access can be limited to the minimum availability that SBCCI would permit. Citizens may reproduce copies of the law for many purposes, not only to guide their actions, but to influence future legislation, educate their neighborhood association, or simply to amuse. In our view, to say, as Banks does, they were citing the 1834 case, that the law is free for publication to all is to expand, not factually limit, the extent of its availability. We turn now, and this is the second point, to whether there's enough originality here to claim a copyright interest in the light of the 1991 Supreme Court decision in the Feist case, which Mr. Johnson uh, cited in his remarks to you. Feist holds that you can't claim originality as to facts. Facts don't become original even when selected and arranged. You need more than a de minimis quantum of creativity, and copyright rewards originality and not effort. And I respectfully submit that the ORS, as it is presented, uh, has effort but not sufficient originality. The cases that talk about copyright in the context of judicial opinions hold that creativity can only proceed in a narrow group. The law has got to be accurate, so the creative is the enemy of the true. The courts also note, as Mr. Johnson did, that uh, there are very few options available for arranging. You've pretty much got to go in numerical and alphabetical order. So I submit that these factors in the context of the law uh, defeat any claim of originality sufficient for a copyright interest. Third point that I'd like to briefly make is the ORS itself, which talks about the need for the greatest feasible access to members of the public. That's a point that the Court of Appeal made in the VEC case. And finally, even if there was a copyright interest, and as stated before, we don't agree that there is, the use that is made by my clients is a fair use. The fair use analysis under the Copyright Act looks at the purpose of the use, which in this case is educational. That's a factor in favor of fair use. It looks at the nature of the work uh, that is being used. In this case, it's all published. So again, that's a factor that cuts strongly in favor of fair use. And it looks on the effect on the market uh, of the use that's being made. And we submit, as Mr. Malamud, I think, aptly uh, explained, that uh, the use that's being made here is not going to have a material effect on any market. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we submit that there, there is nothing that can be copyrighted here, um, and we respectfully urge the committee to disclaim a copyright interest. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, Senator President Courtney, uh, Majority Leader Hunt, uh, Mr. Johnson, and others, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Uh, my name is Tim Stanley. I'm the uh, CEO of Justia. Uh, we do uh, a number of things. We do have some marketing services for lawyers. We build websites and blogs. And separately, we have sort of a, a content, uh, legal content, legal research site, uh, which we use to uh, put up lots of free information, uh, whether it's on the federal side or also on the state side. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I also agree uh, you know, with uh, what uh, Carl and Carl said that you know, the laws cannot be copyrighted. And I think one of the things to note is that the Oregon revised statutes, the reason you have sort of an official published copy, the reason why they're cited in court cases and that's being used as the law. And I think that's a, a relatively important. It's not like a secondary treaty or something like that. This is the law that people are using to make their, their decisions on a daily basis. Um, rather than sort of uh, go into the legal aspects, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, Justy and some of the others were hoping to do with the materials so you have an idea of what we're thinking of towards the future. Obviously, we're sort of the beginning stages of a lot of this. Um, Carl has started some stuff with publicresource.org to really put a large uh, uh, focus in getting a lot, a lot of people sort of working together 
on putting up a large sort of archive of uh, uh, case law, codes, uh, regulations, and it's really now starting to bring in the, both the uh, law professor, legal education community, other nonprofits and other commercial organizations and sort of annotating some of these uh, materials and sort of creating an archive that, that anyone could sort of use to sort of, you know, quickly create new products and new services. Um, with the, with the 50 state, you know, with the, with the state law from Oregon itself and with the, the state, with law from the 50 states, you know, some of the things that we're looking to do um, is do certain comparisons between the different code sections. So you could compare different uh, family code sections or different criminal law code sections. This is both done by looking at individual sections of the codes for the different states, but also sort of tagging the different sections. So you can actually make a, relatively easily, you can make a quick search engine. So you can actually search across all the family codes from among the 50 states just by putting some, some tags in the different parts. Um, in addition to that, and this is something where I think Oregon could probably work a, a little bit on, is putting up all the different versions of the code. So you have the 2007 version code up, but, you know, keep up the 2005, the 2003, the 2001, you know, the 1999 version of the code. Similar to, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the state of Florida does, because often, you know, people are looking for the, the code from a different year, you know, because the, the year that impacts them was back, uh, you know, a few previous years. So right now, if you were to go on the Internet and look around, you can actually find the Oregon code from 2001, 2003. You know, we had it up in 2005 and actually had not put up the 2007 code. Uh, yet, but it'd be nice to have the different versions up there. And once you have those up, you can also do some, uh, you know, relatively nifty things with, uh, you know, programming and using uh, uh, some software to do some uh, quick comparisons of some of the different sections as well. Um, you know, longer term, I, I think the the real key to sort of make this, uh, uh, you know, large. Uh, uh, I'm going to say open source public uh, research uh, uh, platform is to really get the law professors and some of the other lawyers to start annotating the, 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 the cases and the codes and giving their opinions on what, what they believe is, uh, uh, you know, certain sections mean. And part of that is, you know, making sure that, you know, you want some sort of authentication of uh, who's a law professor, who's a lawyer, and there's certain systems working on with that right now. But I think longer term, there's a lot, and I think you've seen right now the blogosphere with lawyers blogging, and you've seen uh, a lot more sort of uh, just sort of real sort of secondary information coming up from attorneys and other law professors especially. Um, they, they, they're looking for a place that they can sort of look to to start and annotate, you know, look to sort of attach their annotations or attach their comments to. And, and they're looking for sort of some of these large databases that, that they could actually link to or cite in some way. So I, I think that as we sort of put this material online and we have multiple versions, you know, there's multiple, there's different states, there's different versions of, of the state code, you know, based on what year it is, not, not people changing the code itself. But allowing these annotations, allowing these professors and these uh, the lawyers who just love to write and love to comment on things, start commenting on it and really start building it up, I think you're going to see something that's uh, really uh, great for everybody. Um, and one of, the, one of the key things, I think, that, you know, the difference between Wikipedia and some of these other sort of citation systems that we're looking at or, or comment sections is that we are looking at how we can authenticate that someone's an attorney or authenticate that someone's a law professor. And we understand the, the Wikipedia articles, and we're certainly not looking to put up the, the code itself as a wiki to allow people to go change it in any way. Um, but the annotation stuff, I think that's something where you could, you know, if you had, you know, certain levels of uh, authentication, you could allow lawyers to sort of get in there and start commenting on things, allow the law professor to start doing things, uh, you know, start giving their comments. And I think it would provide a lot of value. And uh, it's stuff that, you know, people want to do. They're just looking for a place to do it. And that platform is not out there right now. And I certainly don't think it, you know, I mean, well, I don't know. I, I don't expect West or Lexus to actually create that and open that up for the public. You know, I, I could be wrong, but I don't expect them to. Um, and this is something which, you know, from the justice side, and, and we pull down lots, you know, we pull down lots of cases. We send everything that we have over to publicresource.org. We've shared it with lots of people the stuff that we script and we pull down and we mark up. Um, this is something that we're very focused on, is creating this sort of uh, large uh, community, sort of uh, legal research, public policy type database, but really trying to get it going with, with, with the law schools, with the nonprofits, and getting copies everywhere. So we really actually wanted to see if we can't get the annotations in a certain XML format so people could use it on different systems. Maybe even Weston Lexus could use it, you know, as a way to tag into it. Uh, but trying to get the, the core information out to everyone so it, it's really shared and, and it leads to some better decisions for, for everybody as they sort of going forward with the lawsuit. Um, thank you very much.